Good morning. My name is Kurt Bush. I'm the campus pastor here at Trinity Hospers. Welcome to everybody joining us in person and everybody joining us online as well. Um, as we prepare to enter into God's word together, uh, let's, let's take a minute and pray together. God, we pause here as we get ready to engage your word and we just acknowledge who you are, that you are the provider of all things. You're the giver of all good gifts. All that we have is because of you. God, we give you thanks for gathering us here as your people. Uh, we give you thanks for preserving over centuries and generations the text that we're about to open. Um, God, as we do so, would you quiet our hearts, would you quiet our minds so that we might receive from you? God, we ask all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So I want to invite you, if you have a Bible with you, uh, you can open it up to Genesis 16. Uh, the words are also going to be on the screen behind me, uh, but if you have one, you can open it up to Genesis 16. We're going to read the whole chapter uh, together this morning. So hear now the word of the Lord, friends. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abraham, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall, uh, th that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, "'May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace,' And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael. For the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall live at odds with all his kin. So she named the Lord who spoke to her, You are El Roy. For she said, Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore, the well was called Be'er Lahai Roy, and it lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar bore a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is week four in this sermon series called Blessed to be a Blessing. We're going to keep looking at this story of Abram and Sarai. Man, Abraham and Sarah, these things get confused. Sorry, I'm going to just keep saying them wrong. Uh, you get it. You can follow me. Uh, but what we've seen in these last three weeks, and we'll see again this week, that this really is a story about God's faithfulness. This really isn't a story about uh, the human characters. This is a story of God's calling uh, on our lives, on Abram and Sarai's life, and, and it's really a story about blessing them to be on mission with him, right? We've seen this all along. We've seen that God called Abram and Sarai to go, and they go. They lean into obedience. They lean into faithfulness, 
And we see God bless them and equip them to go and be on mission in order to fulfill the call that he's given them, which, remember, is to bless all the nations. We've also seen God's faithfulness when the human character's actions are less than exemplary or less than faithful, less than trusting, like when Abram convinced his wife to lie and say that she was his sister so his life could be spared. Well, unfortunately... Friends, today is a story of much of the same. Only this time, Sarai is the human character that struggles to trust God's promises. Right, in verse 1 right away, the narrator of this wants to let us know where we're at. Wants to remind us of, of what's going on and remind us that there is still no heir. There's still no child for Abram and Sarah, still no promise, just no sign of the promise beginning to happen. Remember the promise. Do you remember what the promise was? It was God telling Abram, I'm going to give you so many descendants that they are going to number as many as the stars, and those descendants then will be the instrument, the vehicle through which all nations are blessed. But there is still no heir. I don't know if you feel the tension. Oftentimes when we have the scripture in front of us and we read it multiple times, we lose the tension, but I think the tension is real, even for us, the reader. What's going on? Where is this air? This promise is hard enough to, to believe boldly anyway, that descendants will be as many as the stars. I wonder how, how different it would be to believe this promise more boldly if Abram and Sarah could actually begin to see the dominoes fall, if maybe they could see one child, one descendant, but still nothing, still nothing, which is probably why we see what is about to happen with Sarah, because remember, we've kind of heard this story before. A couple weeks ago, Abram was so uh, anxious and there was so much tension as to why the promise wasn't happening that Abram said, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to do something that, that probably isn't mine to do. And here we are again with this question, will God really do this? Is God really going to make this promise come to be? This week, it's Sarah's turn to take matters into her own hands. Right, in, in all of this, and all the, what we just read, leading up to Sarah taking things into her own hands, I, I, I don't know what's true here and what she's feeling, but I wonder if it's a, God, if you're not going to do this, then I'm going to do it. If you're not going to begin this process, I'm going to begin this process. That, that's one possibility. Or maybe Sarah was genuinely trying to help the promise along. Maybe this is an earnest attempt that it, may, maybe God is calling us to go this route. Maybe it's just a miscalculated decision. We don't, we don't know. But we do know what she does, and we do know how it goes. She makes up this plan where Abram is going to have a baby with Hagar, who is, as the text puts it, uh, Sarai's Egyptian slave girl. Now, we need to take one sidebar here for just a second. There are some cultural differences between Genesis 16 and Northwest Iowa in 2024. Very strong cultural differences. Uh, these are different worlds, right? These are different worlds, not the same at all. And it's really hard to grasp for us what's going on here because when we read Scripture, we bring our own perspective. The only perspective we have, which is ours, <laughs> It's 2024, it's our, our lifetime of how we've uh, been, been raised. We bring all of that cultural impact into this, but we have to remember that what's going on here with Abram and Hagar probably wasn't as shocking to them as it is to us, right? It, it would not have been out of the ordinary. It would not have been common for someone like Hagar to bear a child for someone like Abram and Sarai, this is maybe not the most shocking part of the story. What is the most shocking part of the story is that this is so clearly not part of the plan, right? This is so clearly not part of the promise that God gave. If you remember 
Last week in Genesis 15, we read this. God said these words to Abram. God said, no one but your own issue, which is your own offspring, your own blood, no one but your own issue shall be your heir. This then is what makes this moment, this decision so shocking. And and this is what guarantees negative consequences, guarantees a negative impact for everyone involved. And, And that's exactly what happens, right? Hagar conceives a child. Something happens in that relationship where there's contempt. I, I don't know. I imagine there's maybe some, I got, I conceived a child. You didn't. I don't, we don't, we don't know, but there's some contempt. Sarai responds And it says that Sarai deals harshly with Hagar. Now, I don't know about you, but this is super interesting. We read in the text that Hagar is an Egyptian slave girl. Hagar is not sneaking around with Abram, right? Hagar is not lusting after Abram. Hagar is simply doing what Sarai has instructed her to do as a plan. This would be like me going to the barber and telling the barber, hey, can you cut my beard off? I'm done having a beard. And he gets done, and then I go like, what? Where's my beard? Right? This is a, a similar example. Hagar is not sneaking around here, and yet something happens where Sarai says, I'm going to deal harshly. It's worth noting that Abram encourages it too. Both human characters here have a moment that a poor decision is made, but Sarah lashes out. She lashes out so harshly that Hagar runs away. Friends, this is telling as to how harsh this was. Now, we, we might imagine if this was somebody today in a relationship where they're being treated harshly, we, we would imagine a couple things, that, that maybe they would go stay with a friend or a family member, right? They would find another place to, to, to live and to be. Or maybe they would find a social agency that could help them out, help them uh, navigate a tough transition. Obviously, none of this was available to Hagar. Hagar is an Egyptian slave girl. Again, culturally speaking, what this meant was that also her security and her provision came from the house of Abram. They, they were solely responsible for her, for her well-being, for her care, for providing all the things she needed. And in this moment, Hagar says, I'm leaving. I'm going to leave my security behind. I'm going to leave my protection behind. I'm going to leave all the things behind. There were no options for her. She was alone. What's remarkable then is what happens next. I think this is actually the most remarkable part of the story because it again reminds us that this isn't a story about Sarai. It's actually not even a story about Hagar. It's a story about God. It's a story about a God who shows up and gives his presence not just to Abram, not just to the like chosen main human character of this story, but also shows up and gives his presence to Hagar. God then, through this angel, says to Hagar, go back. In a moment of isolation, in a moment of being alone, probably frightened, being vulnerable, God says, I see you, and go back. I want to take another pause here, because this is another sidebar that's hard with this text. This text, friends, for a long time, has gotten twisted and used in situations where people that are being treated harshly by partners or spouses, this text is used to tell them, go back. Go back, or, or you should stay with the person that's dealing harshly with you, or you should stay with an abuser. Right? People will say, see, Sarai treated Hagar harshly, and God said you should go back, so you, victim, should go back. I, I want you to hear me say really clearly today that any reading of this that guilts victims or guilts people who are being treated harshly abused 
any reading that guilts them to go back or to stay with someone who's abusing them is not the most faithful reading of this text. It's not, a, not an example of shalom. Not an example of what we see God working towards through the entire scripture. This is a sermon in and of itself, and, and this could be a whole different conversation, but I, I think I just wanted to pause and say there are so many cultural differences that it can be hard to square these things, but this is not a case of scriptural guilt victim shaming. Thank you. Let's get off the sidebar there. What seems striking to me is that Hagar, in this time of vulnerability, in this time of being uh, alone, Hagar comes up with her own name with which she's going to refer to God, her, her own way of remembering who, who God is. And remember, Hagar is Egyptian, right? Hagar is not worshiping Yahweh, the God of Israel, right? Hagar is in the house of Abram, but Yahweh is not Hagar's God at this point, and yet she calls God El Roy, which in Hebrew means the God who sees. The God who sees. It's remarkable, right? When she was alone, when she was without hope, when she was without security, without status, without future, maybe even being forgotten. We, we don't know if she was being forgotten or if Abram and Sarah said, well, there goes Hagar. I guess we'll never see her again. We don't, we, don't, we don't know, but in this moment of vulnerability, God saw her. God saw her. When the human characters once again set aside and abdicated their duties, their responsibilities, God does not. God does not. God shows up. Now, I'm aware, <laughs> I'm aware of how often I say this phrase, God shows up, and I'm also maybe aware that that's pretty abstract. <laughs> so I maybe want to just say a little more about this, because I think this case, when we say God shows up, I think this particular instance has a lot of other scripture that we can look to to understand what that means. Maybe you've heard me say this. Maybe you've heard someone else within Trinity say this. But in our faith tradition, uh, we believe that the clearest picture of who God is, the clearest picture of God's nature and God's heart is seen in the person of Jesus. That the person, the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, as seen in the Gospels, is the clearest picture we have of who God is. So let's look at Jesus to understand what it means that God might show up and God might see people, right? There's a common theme. I'm going to give you two gospel examples. There's a common theme. See if you catch them. In Matthew 9, 36, Jesus uh, sees a crowd of people who are, are crowding around longing to be healed, Longing to be uh, set free from their chains, either uh, spiritually or physically. There's something that they are longing to be freed from. And, and Jesus sees the crowd. He sees the crowd. And Matthew says, it moved him to com compassion. Jesus saw and was moved to compassion. In Luke 7, uh, we see a story where Jesus sees a widow crying, weeping. Jesus sees her and finds out she's weeping because her son had just died. When Jesus saw her weeping, Jesus said, don't weep. Jesus had compassion and raised her son from the dead. Do you see the, the two threads? First is compassion. Compassion. When Jesus sees, almost always there comes this sense of compassion, this sense of care. The second thread is this, that almost all these stories of Jesus seeing people are people on the margins, like Hagar. People who are sick, people who are mourning, people who don't belong people who are poor and in poverty, right? Jesus does not go through the Gospels. We don't see a lot of times where Jesus says, I saw this king or this ruler ruling with mighty power. Jesus sees people like Hagar with no status, no wealth. God especially sees those that others don't. 
Jesus sees the people that others don't. This is the heart of God. This is what we see in the Hagar story. All this makes me wonder. If God is a God who sees, El Roy, and if Jesus shows us through the Gospels that that God is a God who sees. If we see this over and over, it makes me wonder that maybe our call as the church, maybe the way we partner, maybe the most core call is to see people, to be a church that sees. I wonder if this is our call. I wonder if this is what God is calling Trinity Hospers to to be a church that sees, and not just those that are easy to see, but all of our neighbors. I think I shared with you a while back that your elders and deacons and I were engaged in this process uh, that that we called um, writing a, a current reality narrative Maybe you remember hearing this, but, but, but we, we did this because there was a season where, if I'm going to be super honest with you, someone asked me, what is God calling Trinity Hospers to? I, I didn't know. I didn't know how to answer that. So through some wise counsel, we began this process of writing this current reality narrative, and, and this process was so revealing. The purpose of this process is to identify, number one, what God is already doing around us, where God is already acting and working. But the second is this, to to talk to people outside of our circles, to talk to people outside of our spheres, and just to listen. To listen to what's going on so that we might get a clearer picture of what's actually reality in Hospers. So we talked to four people. We talked to an educator, we talked to a nurse practitioner that works here in town, um, and we talked to uh, someone connected with the city, and we talked to a law enforcement agent. And all we sought to do was listen. All we sought to do was, was listen. And, and as we listened to them, they affirmed much of w- what we already knew. They affirmed much of what we already celebrate, right? They, they all said things like this. There's a lot of employers in Hospers. For a small town, this is great. This is a huge benefit. They all said things like the pool, the library, the fitness center. These are all super positive amenities for a small town. They all affirmed things like how safe the community feels. We celebrate these things with them, right? We celebrate that these are things that we all recognize and all affirm. However, there were also some things that we didn't celebrate. Some things that maybe we lament, And I want to say that these are not points of guilt and shame, right? The the point of current reality is not to guilt or shame anyone. The point is just to to know, to to gather facts, to see what's really going on. So I I don't say any of this with any guilt or shame towards anybody. We, We learned these things. We heard hard things. We heard things like this, that, that there are patients at the clinic in town who might go days without getting their prescription because they don't, have a, they don't have a car or they don't have a friend or family member that they can reach out to and say, hey, I need to go to Sheldon. We heard things like uh, parental involvement in kids' education continues to decline. We heard things that, uh, like this, that because of the demands of earning a living in 2024 and how hard this is for all of us, that that kids are alone more now than ever. Maybe the most startling thing is that we we heard this phrase. Someone said, I I think there are a number of unwanted people in Hospers. I think there are a number of unwanted people in Hospers. I don't know about you, but my heart sinks when I think about unwanted people, people feeling unwanted, I, I don't know about you, but maybe our natural tendency is to defend or, or to say, well, that can't be right or to justify why that's not right or to say, well, uh, people aren't known because they don't make an effort. That All those things are our natural tendency. That's our anxiety. Here's what I want to invite you into today. 
not asking, is that true or is that right? I want you to ask the question with me, what if it is? What if it is? What if a number of our neighbors feel unwanted by the very community they live in? What if a number of our neighbors feel un unwanted by the church? What if it's because we're not seeing them? Right, what's also true is that some of this current reality surprised me. I think it surprised a lot of us. I'll name for me, I think it surprised me because I don't hear these stories. I'm not in circles where I hear these stories. I'm not in circles where I see the people that don't have a way to get their prescriptions. These are not circles that I see on a daily basis. So then we have to ask the question, what keeps me from seeing them? What keeps us from seeing them? Discomfort? Yeah, probably. Fear? Yes, probably. Shame? Yes, absolutely. It's this voice that says, even if I do see them, I don't know what to say. And I'm going to say the wrong thing, or I'm going to do the wrong thing. Yes, all of those things are true, whatever the reason. What seems to be true is there's parts of our community that, that the church isn't seeing. No guilt and shame. It just is. I, I, w I want to wonder this too with you, with the Hagar story fresh in our view here. I, I, I wonder about this. I, I wonder if we have a hard time seeing people because maybe we haven't fully been seen ourselves. I wonder how you would answer this question. Would you say that you've allowed God to see you? You don't have to answer it, but I want you to think about that. Have, have you allowed God to actually see who you are? I'm just not sure that we can see others well unless we've been seen ourselves. Maybe the question is this. Maybe the curiosity is this. Do you feel a resistance to that? Do you feel a resistance of being seen by God like Hagar was, vulnerably, authentically? Do you feel a resistance? Does it feel scary? It might. I talk to you a lot about emotional health. And, and much of that emotional health work revolves around shame and the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves and about God that may not be actually true. But we believe them, and for a long time we hold on to them. I'll tell you one story. For a long time I believed and still sometimes have to fight the belief that I'm an imposter. That if, if, that if you all really actually knew how little I know, that you would withdraw from me. I imagine all of us have something similar. Maybe that resonates with you. And, and I'm grateful for the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm grateful for some good coaches that have given me the ability to combat those stories. But I can look back and see my life at their worst. I also believe those stories about God. I, I also believe the story that if God really knew who I was, God would withdraw. If God really knew who I was, God would say, Kurt, you gotta get your stuff together. That if God really knew who I was, God would say, what a disappointment, right? I don't know, maybe that hits home for you like it does for me. Maybe it doesn't, but if it does, I, I want you to hear me say those are, those are lies. Because of Jesus, God delights in you. Let me say that again. Because of Jesus, God delights in you. God desires wholeness. God desires that you don't hide from him. And just like in Hagar's story, God wants to see you. Just like we see in the Gospels of Jesus seeing people and showing compassion, God wants to see you. God, the, the angel uh, asked Hagar, where have you come from? Where are you going? I don't know if you know this, but God knew already. God definitely knew the answer to that question. That question wasn't for God. That question was for Hagar. Just like being seen, when God says, where are you, where am I, the question isn't for God. The question is for us so that we might see that God truly delights and God truly does not withdraw from us. 
That's the invite today. Will you allow God to see you? Will you allow God to, sh- to show himself as the God who sees? And, and will you allow yourself to see and believe and remember that he does not withdraw from you? He does not run from you. God knows all of our hearts better than we do. God shows compassion. Would you allow God to show you compassion the way that Jesus showed all of those people compassion in the Gospels? But may it not end there. May the peace of being seen not end with us. May, may we be seen so that we might go into other places and see others too. God is a God who sees and he is good. This is what Hagar says. May that be our refrain as well. And may we be seen in order to receive grace and courage to see others. Friends, this is, this is my prayer that more than a full sanctuary, more than a, a, an amazing budget, more than glamorous programs, that this is what I hope for for this church in this place more than anything else is that we might be seen by God, all of who we are, so that we might see others. That others around us might see that it, it's okay to be seen by God, that God desires to see them just as much as he desires to see us. Friends, may it be so. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. God, we, we acknowledge that you, just like Hagar said, you are the God who sees. You see us now, you see us yesterday, you will see us tomorrow. And God, what's also true is we sometimes put up barriers that keep you from seeing us, or we think keep you from seeing us. We, we hide. I think all the way back to Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve hide, we hide from you, God. Would you help us to get curious about those things that keep us hiding so that we might be seen by you, so that we might feel your compassion, your love, and your care, so that we might see and believe and trust that you never leave us? And God, would that being seen, would that flow into seeing others? Especially those who today might feel as though they're unwanted. God, we love you, we praise you, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.